Hi everyone, so we've discussed deductive arguments in the past and contrasted them to inductive arguments. So hopefully we have a sense for what the difference is. But as you have seen uh, in examples in class and in particular our quiz and midterm, there are some arguments that sound like they're deductive, right? Where the premises sound like they prove the conclusion, but in fact that they in fact they don't. We can be fooled by the way something is presented, the wording of a premise, and believe that it necessarily leads to certain conclusions. But upon closer inspection, if we think really carefully about it, we realize they don't. Right? So how do we figure this out? How do we determine whether or not premises given to us reasons prove a conclusion if it's not so obvious to our sense of logic? Well, we'll discuss or we'll learn uh, two different techniques for analyzing a, a deductive argument to see if it really is a valid deductive argument. We'll begin today and we'll have two other videos to go over those techniques. Now we'll focus next few videos specifically on deductive logic. How can we come to a sense for the believability of a claim using deduction, using um, reasoning that proves a claim to be true? And we use deductive logic in lots of different aspects of our lives. If, if you've studied mathematics, math uses deductive logic, right? You're given an equation, and if there's one right answer, you come to it using deductive logic. The answer isn't implied. I mean, the answer has to be true. It has to be a certain number. Well, that uses deductive reasoning. You know, philosophers use deductive reasoning to come up with various conclusions about the world. Uh, if you studied any sort of programming, you use deductive reasoning to program, right? You use deductive logic to come up with code that necessarily leads to certain outcomes. Given certain inputs into a computer, there's going to necessarily be certain uh, outputs from that computer, right? That uses deductive reasoning. Uh, in the court of law, deductive reasoning can be used to prove or disprove certain um, accusations. And when you take a look at contracts. Um, lawyers will often look at the wording of a contract and we can use deductive reasoning to conclude whether or not you're obligated to follow certain things, whether or not you're obligated to do certain things. Right? So all of this uses all of these uh, examples of where we use deductive reasoning. But as I mentioned, you know, sometimes it's not so clear when an argument is actually deductive when reasons actually prove a certain conclusion versus when they just imply it, right? So let's take a look at a few examples and you tell me if you think the argument is a valid deductive argument. If I tell you two plus x equals seven, therefore x must equal five. Well, the first sentence gives you premises, reasons to believe the conclusion that I give you in the second sentence, the conclusion that x must equal five. Is this a valid argument? Is it a valid deductive argument? In this case, it is, right? Because if 2 plus x equals 7, then for sure x must equal 5. That's what deductive means, that the conclusion has to be true given the premises. Well, x must equal 5 if 2 plus x equals 7. Yeah? How about this one? Is this a deductive, is this a valid deductive argument? John is 7 years old and Sarah is 6 years old. So Sarah is younger than John. Well, the first sentence gives you the two premises, right? John is seven, Sarah is six. If those are true, does it have to be true that Sarah is younger than John? Well, in this case, yes, right? The premises do lead to the conclusion. The conclusion has to be true. If John is seven and Sarah is six, Sarah has to be younger than John. Just, that's just the definition of what it means to be younger. So this is a valid deductive argument. How about the next one? Grace owns a LeBlanc saxophone. All LeBlanc saxophones are made in France. Hence, Grace owns a saxophone made in France. Okay, well, the conclusion is that Grace owns a saxophone made in France. Does that have to be true, given the premises are true? Well, yes. If Grace owns a LeBlanc saxophone, and we know that all LeBlanc saxophones are made in France, then the one she has must have been made in France. It has to be the case. So we have another valid deductive argument. If I tell you Juan must be rich, everyone who, who is rich took uh, JV's class in critical thinking and Juan took JV's class in critical thinking, well, is this a valid deductive argument? 
Okay, let's, let's make sure we know what the structure of the argument is. The conclusion that we're asked to draw is that Juan must be rich. Okay, the reasons we're given is that everyone who is rich took JV's class in critical thinking, and Juan took JV's class in critical thinking. Now, given those two premises, does it have to be true that Juan must be rich? If you don't see it intuitively, you may want to think about how the premises are phrased. Everyone who is rich took JV's class in critical thinking. So that tells you something about everyone who is rich. That doesn't tell you something about everyone who took a class in critical thinking. So while Juan took the class in critical thinking, that doesn't guarantee that Juan is rich. Saying everyone who is rich took JV's class in critical thinking just tells us everything about the entire group of people who are rich. That if we take a look at that entire group of people, they at one point took this class in critical thinking. So let's assume that we have 100 people who are rich, okay, hypothetically, 100 people who are rich. All we know is that all 100 of them took the class in critical thinking. But if we take a look at all the people that took at the class in critical thinking, we don't know anything about them other than some of them, at least some of them, are rich. If there were 1,000 people that took the class in critical thinking, there could be 900 then who took the class and who are not rich, and one might be one of them. So what we have here is not a deductive argument. It may sound like one, but it's not because the premises don't necessarily lead to the conclusion. How about this next argument? Everything that Pete won at the carnival must be junk. I know that Pete won everything that Bob won, and all the stuff that Bob won is junk. Okay, think about that carefully. What's the conclusion we're asked to draw here? Well, the conclusion that the speaker is making is that everything that Pete won at the carnival must be junk. Take a look at the reasons he gives, or she gives. I know that Pete won everything that Bob won. Okay, and this person also knows that all the stuff that Bob won is junk. Do the premises here necessarily lead to the conclusion? Must it be the case that everything Pete won at the carnival must be junk? Now, on the surface, it may sound like a deductive argument, but upon closer inspection, it's not. So, premises. I know that Pete won everything that Bob won. So we take a look at the bag of winnings that belong to Pete. Here's all Pete's stuff, all the things he won. An elephant, a toy car, uh, a fireman's hat. What we know is that if we were to take a look at all of Bob's winnings, we take a look at the bag that little Bob has of all the things he won at the carnival, Pete has all those things. But it doesn't say that that's all that Pete has. Pete could have more than that, right? Pete could have everything that Bob won and more. So while everything that Bob won is junk, and it's true that Pete has all of those things, which means, you know, Pete has some junk. It doesn't mean Pete couldn't have also won some good things, some things that aren't considered junk. This, then, is not a deductive argument. It may imply that everything Pete won at the carnival must be junk, but it doesn't prove it to be true. So, if you had difficulty seeing that the last two arguments were not deductive, what can you do? What can you do other than just repeatedly seeing arguments over and over again until it becomes intuitive? Well, we have a couple strategies that we'll learn about to make um, analyzing an argument a little bit easier. Two things that we'll want to do when we see an argument to make it easier to analyze is one, we want to rephrase each claim somebody provides to us and put it into a standard form, right? Because the way people talk it varies, and we could say the same thing in lots of different ways, which makes it kind of hard to determine whether or not it's used to prove something. So what we're going to do is rephrase our claims and put them into a standard form categorical claim. So we'll learn a standard form, a standard way of looking at a claim, and we'll rewrite claims to fit the standard form, just to make it a little easier for us to see and understand. 
The second thing is once we have these claims, we want to structure the argument in a way that makes it easy for us to understand, right? So we will reformat arguments given to us into a categorical syllogism. So these are our first two steps um, before we start to analyze an argument to determine whether it's deductive, whether it works or not, whether it's valid or strong. We will, one, rephrase all our claims to put them into a standard form, and we will, two, structure or rephrase the argument to put them into a standard form, both of which will hopefully make it easier for us to see whether or not they are deductive. Okay, so there are four categorical standard form claims. Um, what this means is that when we have a claim, we can rephrase it in a way in which we are talking about categories of things. And we have four of these um, that we will use. The first is an A claim. And an A claim is saying something about all of a group, right? Hence, A claim, all. They are all claims. All some things are something else. For example, all De Anza students are human. This is an A claim because it has that form of all X, R, Y. All De Anza students are human. So notice it makes use of two different categories. The first category refers to De Anza students, and the second category refers to humans. The second type of standard claim is an E claim. So an E claim is where we exclude a group, right? We're saying something is not true of a group. So no some things are something. An example of this would be no De Anza students are Martians. So our two categories are De Anza students and Martians, and we're saying there are no De Anza students that are Martians. Okay? It's an exclusionary sort of claim, an E claim. The third standard claim are I claims, and I claims are going to be including something, right? So some some things are something else. So it's an exclusion. We're including, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're including something. So an example would be some De Anza students are Asian. So our two categories are De Anza students and Asian, and the relationship is saying some De Anza students are Asian. Right? That's an I claim. The last standard form categorical claim are O claims. And the O claims take on the form of some some things are not something else. Okay, So all, some X's are not Y's. An example of this um, is some De Anza students are not Asian. Now, these are our four standard form categorical claims. And when we hear an argument and hear premises, what we'll try to do first is to rephrase the claim to fit one of these four standard form categorical claims. And as we start to do that, our understanding of the premises should become a little clearer as it becomes more intuitive what they mean. Okay, so the goal at first for you is to memorize these different types of claims. A claims, E claims, I claims, O claims. Get used to what they are, how they work. So the second part is to then change an argument or rephrase it, not change it, but rephrase it in a way where it looks familiar. Right? And the most common form of a deductive argument is a syllogism. A syllogism is a two-premise deductive argument where you have a premise, a premise, and then a conclusion. So the two premises work together to lead to the conclusion. So this is an example of a syllogism, right? John is seven years old, first premise. Sarah is six years old, second premise. And knowing those two things, you can come to the conclusion that Sarah is younger than John. So premise, premise, conclusion. So let's draw this out or write this out more explicitly. Premise one, John is seven years old. Premise two, Sarah is six years old, which leads to the conclusion, Sarah is younger than John. That's a syllogism. So let's take a look at an example of some syllogisms. So example number one, all smart people are critical thinkers. Okay, so that's our first premise. And notice that the claim is written in one of our four standard form uh, categorical claims, right? And if you notice, all blanks are blanks. That's a 
a claim. Premise two, all philosophers are smart people. Again, notice the, the form here. Uh, this is an all claim again. So again, it's an A claim. Now, given these two premises, all smart people are critical thinkers and all philosoph philosophers are smart people, can you come to any conclusion? Can you draw any other claim necessarily from those first two claims? Well, hopefully you see that given the premises, it has to be true that all philosophers are critical thinkers, right? That has to be true given the first two premises. So what we see here are three different claims. They all are within our standard form for categorical claims, right? They're all A claims, and they're phrased as a syllogism, premise, premise leading to a conclusion, okay? Our second example... Some lizards are reptiles. Do you recognize that form of that claim? Some lizards are reptiles. So that's in our I claim form, right? Two, all reptiles are beautiful creatures. Okay, hopefully you recognize that as uh, being a, a claim. Now, can you come to a conclusion based upon these two premises? If you know that some lizards are reptiles, if you know that all reptiles are beautiful creatures, can you say something, can you conclude something about reptiles, lizards, beautiful creatures? Hopefully you can see that you can now say something about lizards that you couldn't say before. Based upon the two premises given, we can now conclude that some lizards are beautiful creatures. Right? That conclusion has to be true if the premises are true. So these are all deductive arguments, and we've placed them, made them uh, into a format um, that hopefully will allow us to more easily see what premises are saying, how the arguments work, and by changing all the arguments that we'll be exposed to into this form, uh, we can more easily determine that, oh, yes, the argument does work. It is deductive. Or go, no, 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 it actually doesn't work. Right? The premises don't necessarily lead to the conclusion. So we will do this by using two different methods. We'll do our analysis using uh, the Venn diagram method first. Uh, and that will happen in our next video. And the validity rules method second. And that will happen in the uh, second video after this one. But in order for us to even start using those strategies for analyzing arguments, we need to get used to um, changing claims into standard forms. Uh, we need to get used to rephrasing an argument into a syllogism. And we should start to get used to how to draw claims uh, as Venn diagrams. Okay, So those are all the skills we'll try to learn in this video. The big idea here is that Arguments can sound logical, they can sound deductive, um, and it's not rhetoric that's fooling us, it's not emotion that's fooling us, it's just that our sense of logic is fooling us, right? We're not thinking carefully about how the logic works. And if it's difficult for you to see how the logic works intuitively, right off the bat, using the Venn diagram method and using the rules method are ways in which you can analyze an argument. Uh, and maybe it becomes intuitive over time, right? But to start out with, these uh, strategies could be useful before it becomes intuitive for you. So in essence, what we're going to be trying to do is train ourselves. We're going to be training ourselves to use these strategies, these techniques, in order to become critical thinking ninjas, in order to be able to see an argument, slice it and dice it in ways in which we can easily determine, is this valid? Is this invalid? Uh, does the argument actually work as a deductive one, or should we really consider it as inductive? All right. So... Here is our training. The first step in our training is to be able to take a claim and then turn it into one of our four standard form claims. Okay, so remember, we have A claims, E claims, I claims, O claims. Let's take a look at this claim. Every salamander is a lizard. Okay, and I put abbreviations there, I put letters there, so that if you wanted to, you could uh, reduce what you're looking at so instead of saying every salamander is a litter, lizard, uh, you can reduce that to uh, a sentence, every S is a P, uh, just to make it 
simpler, just so that you don't get confused with words. So every salamander is a lizard. How could you turn that into one of these standard form claims? Which claim does this claim mean? When you say every salamander is a lizard, are you making are you making an A claim? Are you making an E claim? Are you making an I claim? Or are you making an O claim? Well, hopefully you can see that by saying every salamander, we're talking about all salamanders, right? So it's an A claim, since we're talking about an entire group of something. Okay, so how would you phrase the A claim? Is it saying all lizards are salamanders? Or is it saying all salamanders are lizards? Because they're not the same thing, right? By saying all De Anza students are human, we are not also saying all humans are De Anza students. So the order of the categories is important here. So if we're going to convert every salamander, every salamander is a lizard into a standard claim, you would turn it into an A claim that looks like all salamanders are lizards. Okay, take a second if that's not intuitive and see if you can see how that works. Every salamander is a lizard. It's the same thing as saying all salamanders are lizards. Okay, let's take a look at another example. None of the burrowing snakes are poisonous. Okay, so one thing to keep note of is remember we need to determine in, in turning them into categorical uh, claims, we need to make sure that we have categories of things, right? So if we say none of the burrowing snakes are poisonous, well, what are our two categories of things? In this case, you could say burrowing snakes is a category of a thing. Now, poisonous isn't really a category. Poisonous snakes is a category of things. So those would be our two categories of things. So now the question is, which type of uh, standard form claim is this particular claim? Is it an A claim? Is it saying something about all of a group? Is it an E claim? Is it an I claim? Or is it an O claim? Well, hopefully you notice that the word none, you know, refers to none of something, no of a group, right? We're excluding a group from something. None of the burrowing snakes are poisonous. We're excluding burrowing snakes from the group of poisonous snakes, right? So it's an E claim. So how would we phrase it? To say none of the burrowing snakes are poisonous is to say no burrowing snakes are poisonous snakes, right? That's the equivalent. That's the standard form categorical claim equivalent. They mean the same thing. Hopefully you see that. To say none of the burrowing snakes are poisonous is to say no burrowing snakes are poisonous snakes. Now the reason, again, that we're, we're translating these claims into our standard form claim is that once we're able to do that, then we have techniques and strategies, Venn diagrams and rules that we could use to analyze the claim, uh, analyze the argument. But to use those strategies, we first have to put all these claims into standard form categorical claim form. Okay, let's try another example. There are allergies that can kill you. Okay, so what are the groups that we're talking about? What are the categories? Well. Allergies seems to be a group. Can kill you is not really a group. Things that can kill you is a group. Allergies that can kill you is a group. So you need to phrase the um, standard form claim in terms of two different groups. So pick the way you want to phrase it and just stick to it. So which type of claim is it? Uh, are we saying something about all of a group? Well, not really. There are allergies that can kill you. It doesn't say anything about all allergies, nor does it say anything about all things that can kill you. Is it an e-claim? Are we excluding something? Well, the way it's phrased doesn't sound like an e-claim. We're not saying there are no somethings of something else. Instead, what we have here is an i-claim, right? Um, if I say there are beds that are firm, I'm not saying all beds are firm. I'm saying that there are some that exist that are firm, right? So it's a I claim. We're talking about some of some things here. So there are allergies that can kill you should be rephrased to um, some allergies are things that can kill you. Some allergies are allergies that can kill you, right? Both of those have the same meaning. So it becomes something like this.
Okay. Now the key though is however you phrase your claims, or I'm sorry, however you phrase your categories, you have to be consistent so that when you're referring to that same category again later on in the argument, you stick to how you phrased it right throughout. So you have the same phrasing. So if you say some allergies are things that can kill you, then in other claims within the argument, if you were to refer to allergies again, make sure you say allergies. If you were to refer to things that can kill you, make sure you refer to that exact same phrasing and don't change it to uh, allergies that can kill you. Okay, Because we want to be consistent with our categories within an argument. Okay, let's try another claim. Not every lizard is a salamander. Okay, so obviously our two groups are lizards and salamanders. Those are our two categories. And then if we take a look at what it's saying, is it saying something about all of something? Not explicitly. Is it excluding something? Not every lizard is a salamander. It's exclusionary, but it's not excluding a whole group of something, right? It's saying not every lizard. So some of these lizards are not something. Well, that's an O claim, right? An O claim says some somethings are not something. And that's what we see here. Not every lizard is a salamander. So it's excluding something by saying not, but it's not excluding the entire group, right? It's not saying something about all lizards. It's just saying, well, not every lizard means that there are some lizards that are not salamanders. Hopefully you can see that. And if not, take a second to think carefully about the words and how they're used here. Not every lizard is a salamander means there are some salamanders that are not lizards. Okay? So, let's try another one. Only reptiles can be lizards. What does this mean? What does it mean to say only reptiles can be lizards? Think about that for a second. If I said to you, only humans can be De Anza students, what am I saying? What does that claim mean? Is it an exclusionary claim? Am I saying something about a, 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 a group, a small group of a, of a category, some of it? Am I saying something about all of a category? Only reptiles can be lizards. Only reptiles can be lizards. Well, if you think about it, I'm really saying something about all lizards. That if we were to take a look at all the lizards that exist, what are they? Well, they're all reptiles. Yeah? So this means all lizards are reptiles. So notice, there's lots of ways of phrasing a claim, and it have the same meaning. The problem is that because there's so many different ways of phrasing a claim, it can be kind of confusing as to what the claim is saying. So our first step is to first translate all the various ways of saying a claim into one of our four standard ways. And by doing that, hopefully it becomes a little bit easier to make sense of the claim, and then it becomes a little bit easier to make sense of the argument. Okay. To make a claim more uh, apparent to us, to give us a better sense for what a claim is saying, it might be useful to draw it, to see graphically what a claim is saying. So when we have a categorical claim, we have a claim that's saying something about two different categories, two different groups of things. <clears throat> so we can use Venn diagrams. We can use circles to represent each of those groups. What we'll do is we'll have the circles overlap. So we'll have category one overlap category two, and then we'll follow these two rules on what to do when we're given a premise. First is we're going to gray out what does not exist. So when you have two overlapping circles, you're going to have three different parts to it. You're going to have one part that's outside of the overlap. You're going to have the overlap. And then you have a third part that's on the other side of the overlap. Let's take a look here. So here are two different circles. They each represent two different categories. S in this case represents the category of humans. P in this case represents the category of mammals. We draw the claims, or we draw the categories overlapping, and then we shade out what does not exist 
given what the premise is saying. So if we take a look here. S represents all humans. P represents all mammals. The claim is all humans are mammals. So if you take a look at our humans, our S's, the only ones that exist are the ones that are also mammals, right? So that's represented by this overlap here. This center section represents all humans that are mammals. So we gray out the section that's outside the overlap because that does not exist. There are no humans that are also not mammals. That's why we gray this out because there are no humans outside of this overlap. If that's a little confusing, you might want to watch the video again and try to walk through with me the explanation of how to shade here. Let's take a look at another example of what to do. So uh, our claim here is an e-claim, no cats are dogs. So our two categories are cats and dogs. So again, we're going to draw them as overlapping circles, one circle representing cats, one circle representing dogs. So you're going to have three different sections, just like we had here, right? You have an outside section, an inside section, and another outside section. When we say no cats are dogs, that are no cats that are also dogs at the same time, right? So if that's true, what section do we gray out? Well, we gray out the section that overlaps. We gray out the section that says cats are also dogs. We know that does not exist. So that is what we gray out. Okay. Now let's take a look at the second uh, instruction here is when we can't gray anything out, if the claim does not exclude anything, right, if we can't, can't gray anything out, we place an X where you know there's at least one member in the group. Now what does that mean? Let's take a look at our next claim. Some citizens are voters. So we have a group, a category, citizens. We have another category, voters. We're going to draw them as overlapping circles like we did previously. Now the claim is that some citizens are voters, which means there's at least one citizen that is also a voter. Well, if you take a look at our instructions, when you can't grant anything out, place an X where you know there's at least one member in the group. The claim some citizens are voters does not gray anything out. It does not tell us what something cannot be. Instead, all it says is that there's at least one citizen that's also a voter. So according to our second instruction, that means we need to place an X where you know there's at least one member in the group. So the X is placed here because we know that there's at least one citizen that's also a voter at the same time. So that X goes inside where the overlap is, because that's where there's at least one citizen that's also a voter. Let's take a look at one last example, right? We still have an O claim. So an O claim says some somethings are not something else. In this case, in this case, let's take a look at the claim that says some contestants are not winners. You can play games, you can be a contestant, and you could lose, right? There might only be one winner. So some contestants are not winners. Now what would that look like? You have your two circles, you put them overlapping each other. To say some contestants are not winners is to say there's at least one contestant that did not win. So can you see where you might put the X? Well, the X is not going to go in the overlap because that means there is a contestant that is a winner. Instead, the X is going to go outside the overlap, right? It's going to go outside here to indicate there's at least one S, there's at least one contestant that's not a winner, that's not inside this overlap, right? Because the overlap means both contestant and winner at the same time. To put an X outside here is to say there's at least one contestant that is not also a winner. Now, the idea is that when you are given claims that don't look like a standard form claim and it's not obvious to you what it should be, right? is it an I claim, is it an A claim, is it a no claim? For some of you who are more graphically inclined, it may be easier to first draw it. Okay, I'm given this claim, only reptiles are salamanders. What does that mean? What kind of claim should it be? You might, it might be more intuitive for you to draw them first, to draw, do overlapping categories, 
lizards, um, reptiles overlapping, and then determine when it says only reptiles are lizards, what do I gray out? What do I X? And then when you draw it, you can come back to our list here and go, oh, okay, so that looks like an A claim. So then I should phrase or rephrase that premise as all somethings are something else, right? All uh, uh, lizards are reptiles. Uh, that's the idea. So if we take a look at this claim, every salamander is a lizard. And if it's not, too, if it's not obvious to you how to convert them into our standard form claim, you might want to draw, okay, salamanders and lizards as overlapping circles. And to say every salamander is a lizard means there's no salamander that is not a lizard, right? So you gray out the section that's outside the overlap. And then you see, oh, look, that, that sketch, this, um, this Venn diagram is a Venn diagram for an A claim. Now, one thing I know about A claims is when you take a um, claim and you draw it, it could very well be that when you draw it, you're, you shade the opposite end here. So you shade this side instead of that side. So if you do that, if you take a claim and when you draw it out into the Venn diagram, you end up shading the opposite side, what does that tell you? It just tells you that your categories need to be flipped, right? That the, the order in which you are stating your categories needs to be the other way around. And then you'll end up having the standard A claim. Okay, so that gives you a sense for how to determine the order in which you place the categories within a claim. When you read none of the burrowing snakes are poisonous, okay, you may want to draw that first. You draw your two circles, one for burrowing snakes, one for poisonous snakes, and you say to yourself, okay, none of the burrowing snakes are poisonous, which means there's no overlap, right? There are no burrowing snakes that are also poisonous. So you sketch out the overlap, you gray it out. Well, that shows you that it's an e-claim, doesn't it? And when you see it's an e-claim, then you may go, okay, so I need to phrase it in the no somethings are something form. Let's take a look at another one. Only reptiles can be lizards. So we just discussed a second ago. Only reptiles can be lizards means you need to gray out all of the lizards that are also not reptiles, right? There is no such thing as a lizard that's not also a reptile. So that goes away. And then you take a look and you notice that fits with our A claim. That's what this drawing is. And then you can restate only reptiles can be lizards as all lizards are reptiles. So what I suggest you do is to take a look at exercises 8-1, numbers 4, 5, 11, 17, and 20, and then exercise 8-2, numbers 2 and 5, and see if you can take the claim that's given to you and then rephrase it into one of our four standard form categorical claims. It takes practice to see a claim and figure out what it's actually saying, rephrase it as one of our standard form claims. Uh, if you want to, go ahead and draw the claim out with their Venn diagrams to give you sense for what type of claim it is, A, E, I, or O. Um, if that's not intuitive for you, then go ahead and just read it and see if you can convert it just by reading it. And then come back and we'll compare your answers. Hopefully you've had a minute or two to look, take a look at all of those claims. And let's see if what you wrote matches what we have here. So number four, you should have an A claim. That's the first thing. Make sure that what you wrote is an A claim. All some things are something else. The second thing to check is to see if the categories are in the right order. So the first category must be something to the effect of members of the suborder Ophidia. So remember, it has to be a noun. So it has to be a, you, when you label the claim, it has to be a group of something. So the way the book phrases this claim is members of the suborder Ophidia. If you phrase it differently, that's fine as long as you're referring to that same group, right? What you're not referring to here are snakes because snakes is the second category. So here you notice all members of the suborder Ophidia, that's the first category, are snakes. Snakes is the second category. So your claim has to look like that. It has to be an A claim. The first group has to refer to suborder Ophidia. The second group has to refer to snakes. You can't swap those two. 
Otherwise, it doesn't mean the same thing, right? All um, DeAnza students are human is not the same thing as all humans are DeAnza students. Okay, second, number five. Again, it's actually saying the same thing. All members of suborder Phidia are snakes. So hopefully you notice that the claim in four and the claim in five are actually saying the same thing. Let's take a look at number 11. All times the frog population decreases are times the snake population decreases. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that it's an A claim. So hopefully you came up with some sort of A claim. The second thing to notice are the two different categories. So the textbook answer has the first category being phrased at times the frog population decreases. Remember, we need to create a category of a thing. So the category that the book creates here is times the frog population decreases. You could phrase this any way you like, right? As long as you know you're referring to this thing, this category of when the population decreases for frogs. So phrase it any way you like. R, and then the second category has to do with times the snake population decreases. Again, you can phrase that any way you like, as long as you know you are also referring, you're, you are also referring to times the snake population decreases. So that, those have to be the two categories, and it has to be in that order for an A claim, okay? Your wording might be a little different. The way you label the categories might be a little bit different, but the meaning has to be the same. You have to be talking about fog, frog population decreases in the first category, snake population decreasing in the second category, and it has to be in this order. And if you have that, an A claim with those two claims and that, those two categories in that order, then your uh, translation is fine. Let's take a look at number 17. No people identical to the bank robber are people identical to Jane's fiance. So the first thing to note, what type of claim? We're talking about a no claim, right? So it's an exclusionary claim. It's an E claim. So hopefully you can, came up with an E claim. The second thing to note are the categories. Now, the book likes to refer to people identical to as a group oftentimes. So if you ever take a look at answers in the back, you'll see things like people identical to, and that's the book's way of categorizing a group, right? So if you said something like, no bank robbers, that's fine too, as long as you know you're talking about you know, bank robbers, are Jane's fiancés, well, that works too, right? That, that's fine too, as long as you know what you're referring to. So it, it has to be those two groups, bank robbers, Jane's fiancés, and it has to be a no claim. Now notice, if you were to take a look at a no claims diagram, If you take a look at no claims diagram here, it's symmetrical, which means if you were to flip the S and P, if you were to flip the categories and, and to say no PRSs, no poison snakes are burrowing snakes, it means the same thing as saying no burrowing snakes are poison snakes. So for the E claim, you can switch the categories and the claim is still saying the same thing, right? It's still a, a truthful claim. So when you write no, people identical to bank robbers are people identical to Jane's fiance. That's the same thing as saying no, people identical to Jane's fiancés are people identical to the bank robbers, right? It's the same thing. Uh, to say uh, no students in our class are Martian is the same thing as saying there are no Martians or you know, students in our class. Same meaning, right? In effect, it's saying the same thing. So if you had switched these two categories, but you still had a no claim, you're fine. Okay. Let's look at 17. Some examples of corn are not things that make good popcorn. So the key first is to recognize that we're talking about uh, an O claim, right? Some, some things are not something else. So that's an O claim. So hopefully you came up with an O claim. The second thing to notice are the two categories and the order that they're in. So to say some examples of corn are not things that make good popcorn, well, the two groups are examples of corn uh, or corn and, you know, not good popcorn or things that don't make good popcorn or any way you want to phrase that. Those are the two categories. And in this case, you have to have that order, right? To say some examples of corn are not things that make good popcorn. 
is not the same thing as saying some things that make good popcorn are not examples of corn. They do not mean the same thing. And the way to tell is by taking a look at the diagram for O claims. So we take a look at an O claim. Right here, notice that the X is outside here within the S circle, right? It's not symmetrical, so you can't flip it. You can't say some P's are not S's. It won't mean the same thing as some S's are not P's because your X would be in a different place, right? So if you take a look, the only two that are symmetrical are E claims and I claims. So those, you can, you can flip the order of the categories and it means the same thing. But for A claims and O claims, you cannot flip the categories because the claim will not mean the same thing. Now, if that's not intuitive to you, if it's not intuitive why some contestants are not winners, does not mean the same thing as some winners are not contestants. Um, you may just want to draw it out and just remember that you can't flip it because based on the drawing, it won't look the same. Uh, but hopefully, slowly, you can start to re rationalize for yourself, think of for yourself intuitively how saying some contestants are not winners is not the same thing as saying some winners are not contestants. This is where we can get fooled, right? This is when our logic can deceive us. It may, may feel like it's the same, but really, they're not saying the exact same thing. So let's take a look again here. So we're at number 20, okay? So if it has this, if you have this form of claim, right, an O claim, and if you have these two categories in this order, then your answer is correct. Let's take a look at exercise 8-2, number two. Hopefully you recognize that this is a, an exclusionary claim, right? We're excluding all students of mine. So first thing to note is whether or not you have an E claim. No students of mine are students who are failing. So those are our two categories, uh, students of mine and students who are failing. You can phrase those any way you like. Just make sure you stay consistent uh, when you start phrasing other claims within the same argument. So. Here, it's an E claim, and like we said for E claims, the order doesn't matter. So if you were to said no students of my, uh, no students who are failing are students of mine, that works too, right? It's saying the same thing. Again, if it's not intuitive to you how it's saying the same thing, think back to the diagram. The, the, section, the section that is shaded is in the center. So if you switch the terms, the diagram still looks the same. So the meaning of the claim is still the same, okay? Though uh, I hope that the claim itself, you can just think about what the words mean and realize to say, no students of mine are, are students who are failing, means the same thing as saying, no students who are failing are students of mine. Let's take a look at one more, number five. All times that Joan sings are times people make faces. Again, the first thing to note is that it's an A claim. So hopefully you wrote an A claim down. The second thing to check is to see if you have the right order of the categories. So the first category has to do with Joan, right? Joan singing, times in which Joan sings. So all times that Joan sings are times we see people make faces. So it has to be in that order. Whether or not you phrase the categories exactly the same, it doesn't matter so much as long as you're consistent with other claims. The important part is that you have the right order of these two categories. Joan singing first, people fa making faces second. All times Joan sings are times that people make faces. If you have that order and you have an A claim, then you have a correct response, a, co a correct translation of the claim you saw in the text. Now, this is often the most difficult section of the, the class doing deductive analysis like this converting everything into categorical claims, and then converting everything to syllogism, and then using what we're going to learn next time, which is Venn diagrams. Oftentimes, this is the most difficult section because we're not used to thinking about claims this way. In fact, we're not really used to thinking about arguments very carefully, right? <laughs> which is why we often get confused, why we can look at a claim like the one in the text and not realize that these claims here in the screen mean the same thing. Um, we can easily be fooled into thinking a claim means something when in fact it doesn't. 
And that's why drawing it might help. Um, that's why trying to visualize the claim might help. And we'll do that for arguments. We'll visualize arguments in our next uh, video.